If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We'll be there uh, most of our time this morning. When I was a junior in college at Washita, uh, we had the uh, opportunity to go to Seattle, Washington for nationals. And while we were there, uh, we had to spend the night. Uh, and, and the le- last day, we were leaving to fly on an airplane to go back to, uh, to here in Arkansas. And so because the last night was the end of our season, several of our teammates decided to do some extracurricular things around the hotel. Me and some buddies decided we weren't going to do that. We wanted to do something else. And so uh, we may have done something worse. I'm not quite sure. We snuck out of the hotel. Uh, we were hungry. And uh, Coach Jim Dan or the Washington administration, if you guys are hearing this, I apologize. You know, 20 years later, I don't know if you can do much. The diploma's on the wall. I'm good. But we left the hotel. We got a, a cab. If you're a young person, we didn't Uber back in those days. We had to get a yellow cab, and we took off to, uh, to the only place that was kind of open near our hotel. It was the entertainment district. We just wanted some food, and we got down there. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning because, you know, college students, they don't sleep. And so we were there, and as we uh, had that experience, it was fun. We enjoyed each other's company. About that time, all of the bars there in Seattle area let out. And we emptied into this sea of people that had uh, been involved in their own extracurricular activities. And I looked at my buddy William and I said, William, do you feel that? He said, I do. It was weird. It's it's unlike anything else I've ever experienced. I've experienced in other places of the world years later. But in that moment, at that time, I had never experienced the oppression of darkness like I did that evening. Seattle, as you well may know, is, is not a place of a lot of Christians, not a place of a lot of light of the gospel, very few believers. And in that moment, in that setting, we could have very well been the only believers in several block radius. And the oppression of darkness was on us. So we ducked into this pizza place, we grabbed uh, some Cokes, and we just sat at the table, and we, do, we did what we only knew to do, which was to pray. And there, as people were filing by, to and fro, that front of that pizza parlor, we just prayed for those who were in darkness. Took a cab ride back to the hotel. It's pretty quiet. We had experienced something we had never experienced before, and what we thought was going to be fun and entertaining turns out to be really, really difficult for us to bear. But we did what we knew to do, which was to pray. Do you all know that we live in darkness? As you work, as you play, as you go to your neighborhoods, there is darkness. And sometimes we get used to that oppression, but I hope and pray that the Spirit of God opens your eyes this morning to see the darkness that's around you and then call you to do what we only can do, which is to pray. Casey mentioned earlier, we're in, we're in this series on neighboring. And the title of the message today is, Do You Love Your Neighbor Enough? to pray. We've spoken a lot about loving our neighbor. We've spoken about uh, loving them enough to start a conversation, to know their name, to invite them to a barbecue or a block party. We've, We've talked about loving them enough to invite them to church, but do you love them enough to pray for them? Praying for those who don't know Jesus makes a lot of sense. People need Jesus. We should pray for them, but unfortunately I'm convinced that it doesn't come very naturally for us. We look at darkness, we look at lostness, we look at people who may not know Christ, and we go, oh, that's a shame. Or bless their... Yeah. But we don't naturally begin to pray for them. It's easy to know someone's name, to invite invite them into your life a bit, but it's something entirely different to be committed to what we just did, which is pray for those who don't know the Lord. So how do we make it more natural? How do we get to a place where praying for the lost isn't such a drudgery uphill experience, but it's something that's a very natural overflow of our experience with Jesus? Because let me tell you something this morning here at church, if you're a believer in Christ and you're, you're in this room or you're in the venue or you're watching online, this morning is for you. You need to find a place of strength and bravery and courage and commitment to be able to say to yourself, I want to pray and be committed to pray for the lost. Now this morning, if you're in earshot of my voice and you don't know the Lord, let me tell you, the gospel is for you. So this morning, I want us to remind ourselves of a few simple truths when it comes to praying for the lost. You're taking notes, I've got a lot to say, so you better get ready to write. Number one, we're commanded to pray for the lost. We're commanded 
to pray for the lost. This is Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And of course, we know the relationship between Paul, the apostle, and Timothy, the protege. And Timothy is there at the church, leading the church of Ephesus. And as you well may know, there's, there's doctrinal issues within the church. So Timothy's got his hands full. And, and Paul knows that the church is, that are in Ephesus is surrounded by persecution. And so after the first uh, First little warning that Paul gives to Timothy about false teachers, he doesn't really give them an action plan other than this. Now, pray. Read these words, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. It says this. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayer, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of our God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, Paul mentions here to Timothy that we should be in prayer for all people, but he doesn't just say pray for them. He says pray, 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 pray. Paul lists four different kinds of prayers, and I think it's important for us just to unpack each one. He says offer supplications to them. A word simply means to, a simple request to God. And then he uses a very general word. He says, pray for them. Offer them prayers. A, a word meant to be used in the New Testament that kind of encompasses all kinds of prayer. And then he gets specific. He says, I want you to intercede for them. I want you to pray specifically for those people, those needs. And then last, he says, I want you to envelop this idea of prayer the concept of being grateful and thankful to our Lord and Savior. He doesn't just say pray. He says pray, 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 pray. He wants to be intentional with his young protege, Timothy. He wants to remind him, hey, listen, there, there's opportunity here. And the first action step, as we've talked about the persecution that's in your church and outside your church, is to pray for them. Pray for those in authority. Pray for the believers around you and in the church that they would be dignified and, and pleasing to God in every way. Pray for people to come to know to the knowledge of the truth. And then he reminds them that it is good there in verse 3, it is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior that we pray. God is pleased to see believers earnestly concerned for the salvation of those around them. Paul is saying first and foremost, pray. Pray for all kinds of people that spread the gospel to believers. Pray for them. Pray that those who know Christ would be godly. Pray for those who are lost would be saved. We're commanded to pray for the lost. The progress of the gospel to the world is dependent upon the prayers of the people in this room. This morning I want us to feel the weight of that commandment because it would be a travesty if you left this campus or left your home later today without a weight of concern of the commandment that God's called us to pray for those who don't know Christ that they would know him let's remind ourselves hey salvation ultimately belongs to God but God uses our prayers to accomplish his will. And I want to challenge us this morning to realize that the commandment to pray for the lost is right here in Scripture. And we're called to follow that commandment. So, we've been commanded to pray. The question I have for us this morning is, do you love your neighbor enough to be obedient to the commandment to pray? You know, we've called our church to neighbor this week. And neighboring isn't always easy. Sometimes for a lot of you, it's difficult. You know, we like our garage doors down and our privacy fences up. We, we like the fact that, that we can kind of slide into our house. People don't really know us. Or maybe we've got our favorite neighbors. Or maybe worse, we've got people we'd really rather not neighbor. And we've been calling our church to not just love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, but to follow that second commandment, which is connected to it, to love your neighbor as yourself. It's real easy to come into this place or to read the scripture and know, man, I should love God and learn things on, on how we can love God. But God gives us an application to spiritual maturity by saying, I want you to neighbor well, love your neighbor. And that obedience is difficult. But let me tell you, I'm hearing of different things that are happening all across our community from our church and others who are saying, we're going to neighbor well. We're going to get to know people. 
And it's happening from our, our oldest senior adults to even some of our younger kids who are capturing this concept that they want to be obedient to love their neighbor. I heard a story this week of a brother and sister, Jack and Natalie Monroe, who shared with us their concept of being obedient to neighbor. Let's watch this short video. Well, we were challenged to hand out five camp guard cards to our friends. I ended up handing out 10 cards. I ended up handing out 10 cards. It was easy to hand out cards for a camp guy. We told them what we would do on our trucks and where we would go. We're being good neighbors because we're handing out our cards to, other, to our friends. I think my friends will like camp guys. These are grade school kids who are saying, you know what, I'm going to honor the Lord. And I'm going to follow him in obedience. And I want people to know who Jesus is, so I'm going to neighbor. Let me tell us, people, listen, I, that's an encouragement to me. As, as a father, as a pastor, and I'm looking down at our younger ones, and I'm like, that's awesome. This afternoon, our, our students are going to go to Raymar Fields, and they are going to capture this concept of, hey, we're going to love our neighbors. We're going to hang door knockers because we want them to come to a, to a picnic, to, to receive the fellowship of believers, to, re, to hear the gospel message. And that's neighboring. Listen, we've been commanded to neighbors. We praise God for Jack and for Natalie and our students and others around us who are neighboring well. We need to be reminded we've been commanded to neighbor. Number two, we are compelled to pray for the lost. We haven't just been commanded, but we should be compelled. Listen, the mission of our king is to see people saved. Amen? The mission of our Lord and Savior is to see people come to know Jesus, right? It's not about big churches. It's not about fancy things or great ministries. Those things are, are incredible, and they should be tools to finish the mission that God has for us, which is to see people come to know him. Verse 4 here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 says, Desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. This is what God desires, that all people would be saved. All people. Those who are like us and those who are different than us. Those who agree with us politically, agree with us morally, agree with us economically, and those who are very different from us politically, morally economically, all people. It doesn't just say the nice people. It doesn't just say those who, uh, who, who want to help others. It says God's desires for all people. Let me tell you, that's important to our team. It should be important to our church over the last several months. Uh, we're going to begin to unpack some of these realities to you over the next several weeks. But our church staff has been talking about what are some things that we should value as a staff as a church, and we've talked about this idea of gospel hospitality. That we live in a world where everyone should accept everybody else. And the problem with that is often with acceptance comes an agreement to ideology, an agreement to morality that may be a contradiction to the scripture. So we're not calling people to agree with each other. We're calling people to be hospitable to each other. Jesus is a great example of gospel hospitality. That although he loved people, he didn't allow them to continue in their sin. He held the scripture standard high, at the same time loved them well. We talk about gospel hospitality here at our church. We want all people to come to know him. And that means that we've got to love all people, even those who are different than us. That we would reflect and mirror the gospel. I want to challenge us this morning that we should be compelled by Jesus' concern. We should be compelled by that concern that all people come to know him. That ought to compel us and move us. Last week our pastor talked about Zacchaeus. In Luke chapter 19 verse 10, Zac uh, Jesus is, is defending why he is going with Zacchaeus, who's a known tax collector. And he says, listen, I have come to seek and save that which is lost. His purpose, his mission, his plight was to impact darkness. That's what his concern was. And that's what ought to be our concern, that we're living among darkness and our desire as individuals or as families or as a church ought to be to impact that 
darkness. I should be compelled by his concern. But I shouldn't just be compelled by his concern. I have got to think about his desire for all humanity. Second Peter verses three, sorry, chapter three, verse nine says, The Lord is slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should find and reach repentance. The prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 33 says this, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live, turn back, turn back from your evil way. Time and time again, the God of the Old Testament, Jesus in the New Testament, we see that God's desire is to have people repent of their sin. That's his concern. And the question I have for us is, does that compel me to pray for the lost? That my life is about his mission. If he was so concerned about it, how come I struggle to move my life in the midst of that concern and be committed to pray for those who need Christ? We should be compelled by Jesus' concern, but we also should be compelled by man's condition. Compelled by man's condition. When I think of someone's pain, it causes me to pray. Yesterday, we had the unique experience. First time for our family, um, we graduated one out of high school. Whew, done with that deal. Our oldest son, Gavin, got to graduate. We're excited for him. He's going to go to the University of Arkansas in the fall. And, and uh, as I was kind of thinking about him and thinking about this message, it came to, uh, to me, it helped me understand and remind me that he wrote an essay uh, for a college entrance scholarship called Inhale, Exhale, Breathe. And it was a story that he unpacked that I want to share with you this morning. When we moved to Memphis, where I was serving uh, a church there, we had, had lived there for a few months, and then school was about to begin. We were living in a mission house that was, oh, probably five or six miles away from the church. And we enrolled Gavin in first grade, and so we had never gone to school before at that time. We had done kindergarten at home, first grade, we're going to school. And so we get Gavin into school, he's having a great experience for the first couple of days, and then we get a phone call. I get a phone call in my office, and it's, it's the nurse unpacking what happened, telling me what has gone on with Gavin at school. While he was outside, he was at an outdoor classroom playing in the playground, he began to have a massive asthma attack. And we knew that Gavin had asthma, it's something that was very difficult for him as a young boy, it's something he's grown out of as a, as a man, but it's certainly a very significant concern when he was younger. And so while there, he has an asthma attack. The teacher doesn't know him very well, but she grabs him up, knowing he can't breathe, and rushes him to the nurse's office where she calls me. And she said, we need an inhaler right now. And I was like, oh, didn't win the Father of the Year award, didn't drop off inhaler at school. Good for you, Miller, right? So then I decide to go to my house, where it's just, again, five or six miles away in the opposite direction of our school. And while I'm going, I just begin to pray for Gavin. I don't know what's going on. I, I just know they need an inhaler. I'm the one to go get it. So I go, I grab the inhaler, but, but then I get a second phone call. Are you close? He's in serious condition. Well, in that moment, I, I mean, pedal to the metal, right? I'm going as fast as I can through the, the suburbs of Memphis, and I am praying. I don't know what's going on. I'm just asking God to open his lungs. I'm asking him to calm Gavin down. I'm asking those around him to have the wisdom to understand what to do next. Because I don't know how much time has gone on. I just know I've got to get this to him. So I do all I can do and I pray. Get to the school, put it in park, run inside the office there. And Gavin is just about a shade of gray. The teacher's holding him. The nurse has got the phone in her hand ready to call 911. We give him the inhaler and we had a little holy moment of some tears. I remember thinking in that moment, all I could do was pray. And I, I felt like, I felt like I was about to lose my boy. Inhale, exhale, breathe. In that moment, the Lord just revealed to me something grave. And I was thinking about it this week. I was watching him walk across the stage at graduation. And I thought, am I compelled to pray because people are in pain? And sometimes we as believers, we forget what lostness looks like, what it feels like. The scripture's got some incredible vision as to what that feels like, what that looks like. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. They do not see the gospel of the glory of God. John 3, 18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned. Ephesians 2, 1 says, As for you, you were dead in your sin. 
Ephesians 2, 12, without hope, Paul describes them, without God in the world. Matthew 9, Jesus says they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. This is the condition of man, blind, deceived, condemned, dead, hopeless, helpless. That ought to cause us to pray. We should be compelled by man's condition to pray. We don't know what's going on behind those closed doors in your neighborhood. We don't know the brokenness and the pain and the anxiety and the worry and the sin or the evil presence. We don't know what is going on behind their front door, behind those garage doors or those privacy fences. But let me tell you this, Jesus does. And as we think about the pain that people who do not know Christ are experiencing, it ought to compel us to pray. Yet I fear that we are too busy to pray, or we're not thoughtful enough, or we're selfish, or we don't have the time, or we're not committed to it. Listen, our heartbeat ought to be after Jesus' mission. We ought to be compelled because of his concern, but compelled because of man's condition. 17th century pastor named Richard Baxter said this about 1650. He said this, let your heart yearn for your ungodly neighbors. Alas, there is but a step between them and death. Many hundred diseases are waiting, ready to see them as if they die unregenerate. They will be lost forever. Have you hearts of rock that cannot pity man as such a case as this? Do you not care who is condemned as long as you are saved? Do you meet with them in the streets or work with them or travel with them or sit with them or talk with them or say nothing to them considering of their souls? If their houses were on fire, you would run and help them. Will you not help them when their souls are almost at the fire of hell? Read that this last week. Got me right here. I hope and pray that we're compelled to pray because of the pain that men and women are experiencing without Christ. We need to be reminded. We're commanded to pray. We should be compelled to pray. And last this morning, we are commissioned to pray for the lost. Jesus and Luke chapter 10, he's about to send his disciples out two by two. He's about to remind them of a few things before they go to different villages and, and preach and teach and heal on his behalf. And there in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, he says to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest fields. Praying for the lost means we're praying for believers, praying for each other, to intersect the lives of those who do not know him, to be able to share the gospel with them. I love this passage of Scripture. It's different than the Matthew 9 passage that describes uh, this harvest and, and the fact that we ought to be in prayer for the workers. It, it, it sits on the context of them about to go out. And Jesus says, here's a harvest. And he describes what that harvest is. The harvest is plentiful. It's, it's great. It's profitable. It's overflowing. And he doesn't say, hey, here's this great harvest. I want you to go reap it. He says, here's this great harvest. We need to pray for workers. It's so great you can't handle it. It's so incredible. We need to pray for more people to go and to be workers among the harvest. And he doesn't just say pray. He says pray earnestly. This word earnestly is unique. It means to plead. It means to beg. Who are we begging? The Lord of the harvest. The one who is overseeing the entire ordeal. We're praying to him to provide more workers. Listen, we've been commissioned to be those very workers. We've been commissioned to go and into those harvest fields and impact darkness. Listen, Romans 10 reminds us how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Listen, we're called to be a part of that. We've been commissioned by God to go. We need to pray for one another as we're praying for the lost. Not only commissioned as workers, but commissioned as soldiers. There is a spiritual war going on among your neighbors. Those you live by, those you work by, those you play with. There is a spiritual battle happening. And the question I have for the church, the question I have for you, the question that I've been asking myself this week, am I AWOL or am I in the fight? Because I can invite people all day long. I can get to know who they are. But am I committed to praying for them? 
Am I willing to take up action in prayer and allow prayer to be the work that God's called me to? So the application of this morning is pretty simple. We should pray. We should simply do what God's commanded, what he's compelling, what he's commissioned us to do, which is to pray. But let's put some intentionality to that. So let's pray, but let's pray and tie this idea into neighboring. And I I want us to be thoughtful of a couple of things. We've mentioned this several years ago. We're going to mention it again this morning. I want us to prayer walk as an application of today. What's prayer walking? Prayer walking is praying on site with insight. On site with insight. This afternoon, this week, I want to challenge you to go for a stroll. Walk down your street. Walk through your neighborhood. Walk in your office building. Walk around your gym or where your golf course or wherever you may go play. Your neighbors are those you live around, those that are you work around, and those that you play around. I want to encourage you to prayer walk, to pray on site with insight. Now, if you're taking some notes, just to remind you of a couple of things, a couple of tips on how to prayer walk well. How do we apply all of this? Well, one, before you take your stroll through your neighborhood, take some time to pray for each neighbor or each home or each person you see. You need to prepare your heart. Take some time and center your heart on Christ. Maybe you need to confess sin, remove some obstacles that are in between you and the Lord so that when the Holy Spirit is sensitive to you, you're able to hear it and able to respond to it. So prepare your heart. Pray for spiritual insight as you walk. You know, prayer walking doesn't seem very difficult, but good prayer walking is difficult. Because if you're like me, your mind wanders, or you were praying, and then you forgot what you were praying about, or maybe something grabs your attention, and you kind of lose it, your focus for a minute. So when you are prayer walking, prepare your heart, and then pray for really significant spiritual insight as you prayer walk. I'd encourage you to open your eyes. Be observant to the clues that are right around you. That makes a lot of sense. If you want insight, you need to open your eyes to what you are actually seeing. Ephesians 1 says this, that our eyes would be enlightened to the gospel all around us. I want to encourage you to open your eyes and allow them to be enlightened, to see things in a different way. You're going to see the physical. I want you to see the spiritual behind the physical. So this week I took three prayer walks in my, in my neighborhood. Well, I have, I have a street. We have a street. It's a mile long. And I knew that I couldn't get up here today and tell you to prayer walk if I wasn't prayer walking. So, yeah, guilt made me do it. So I prayed. And I took three prayer walks, and on each of the prayer walks, I saw something unique. On my first prayer walk, I saw a trampoline behind a house that I had never seen before. I had passed this house several times. This house kind of sits off, um, off the road a bit. But this time, I saw a trampoline. And I thought, now, unless there's some really spry grandparents out there doing trampoline by themselves, there's probably some kids around. So I thought, I'm going to pray for some kids. I'm going to pray with whoever kids... Whoever uses that trampoline. And so I just begin to pray for the ups and downs of life that they would see Jesus and respond to him in faith. My second prayer walk, I saw a garden I'd never seen before. And I thought, garden, that person probably gets up in the morning and tends the garden, probably tends it in the afternoon. When I pass this house in the morning or afternoon, I need to look and see if there's anybody in that garden. And then I begin to think about the fruit of that garden. And I begin to pray about the fruit of the gospel in that person's life and the fruit of the spirit if believers live there. My last prayer walk, I, I began to see a van. Now, it sounds kind of, kind of different, right? I see this van pass my house. And I notice this van because this van looks like my family van. But I'd never seen where that van lives. My third prayer walk, I saw where that van lives. And I thought, I'm going to pray for that van. Not only now when I pass that house, but as they pass my house. Three prayer walks, opening my eyes to see not just the physical, but to see the spiritual behind it. You see toys in the yard? Pray for those kids. If you see a house in need of repair or a lawn that needs mowed, pray for an opportunity to serve them. Or maybe it's you who will fulfill that need and open up a conversation to the gospel. If you never see cars at that house... It could be they work at a third shift, or maybe they're just a very, very, very busy family. And pray for them as they serve. Open your eyes. Another tip for prayer walking might be be prepared to stop. Prayer walking is praying on site with insight, but you must be prepared to stop. This last week I I talked, I was was walking on my third prayer walk, and and me and Sawyer had my dog with us, and we were walking down the road, and I'm kind of praying, and 
And we saw this lady come up, and I thought, well, I'm too busy to pray to talk to this lady. I got stuff to pray for. Oh, this, her name is Cindy. She lives around the corner. It's her and her husband. She lives in a brown house. I know exactly where she lives. Now I know who that person is. We got to talk about her love for dogs. And, and I love the fact that now I know Cindy. I wasn't too busy to pray to stop. Listen, sometimes we can be too busy being the church that we forget to be the church. Prepare to stop, have a conversation. What do you pray? I know that for some of us, prayer comes easy. For others of you, you're like, listen, I'm, I'm not a big prayer warrior, but I feel compelled to pray. I, 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 sh- I feel the need to pray. I've been commanded to pray. I want to pray. What do I pray? Can I just encourage you this morning? Romans chapter 8, verse 26. If you don't know what to pray, write down that verse. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. The Spirit, the Scripture says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Listen, the Holy Spirit is interceding for you when you don't know what to pray. Amen to that. You don't know what to pray, God knows what to pray. You don't know what to say, God knows what to say. He is interceding on your behalf. Listen, a couple thoughts here. Pray for boldness for you. Pray for workers, other people to intersect the lives of lost and sin and around you. Pray for opportunities to serve them as you walk by their house, as you get to know who they are. Pray for clarity of the gospel. Sometimes people are very confused about who Jesus is, about what the Bible says, about what the church is about. Pray for clarity that the gospel would be very clear. And then pray for receptivity. Pray that they would receive the gospel, having understand the gospel, and pray that they would come to know who Jesus is through the gospel. It could be you're walking by a house, you see some verses on the, on, on the, the door. It could be you, you see some, some artifact inside the yard that tells you, hey, this person goes to church or this person's a believer. Pray for them. Pray they be set out, set apart by God to do great works. Pray they join you in the work to serve and impact lostness and impact darkness in your neighborhood. Listen, we've been commanded to pray. I hope you're compelled to pray. We've been commissioned to pray. So let's go pray. Hey, this morning, it's simple, but the commitment is difficult. And I hope and pray that you'll be committed to neighbor, but yet you'll love your neighbor enough to pray. Father, we... We are workers in the harvest fields. And maybe we don't look at ourselves quite like that, but the scripture calls us that. We are men and women who've been called to battle, to impact darkness. For the people around us who do not know you are helpless and hopeless, harassed like sheep without a shepherd. God, I know in the last several weeks you've called us to get to know people, to start conversations. You've called us to open up our homes, to love our neighbor as ourselves in very practical, very simple, very easy ways. But this morning is not easy. To be willing to go to battle, to be willing to be considered as a worker, to be willing to impact darkness where we work, live, and play, Father, that's a commitment that requires great courage and boldness and faith. If you're here this morning, I just want to ask you to do a few things. As we continue in the spirit of prayer, I want you to think about one house on your street. Maybe one cubicle or office door where you work, friend, school, Think of one. Take a moment and pray for that person. Pray for that home. Pray for the people who live there, the co-worker, their family. Love them enough in this moment to pray. Pray their eyes would be open 
to see the love of Jesus. Pray their hearts are receptive to receiving the gospel. Father, I'm praying for those who are praying. I'm praying, Lord, they'd be committed to prayer. I would just remind them that this altar is open. It could be they need to make a commitment to be a prayer warrior, and that commitment requires they can't help but come down and use these steps as a place of commitment, a place where they're pouring out their heart and their soul to a friend or a neighbor. I pray, Father, for all of us who are considering this one home or this one person or this one office, whatever it might be, that we be a, a people committed to praying. Because here's what I know, Lord. You answer prayer. Father, I pray that our people are faithful to answer the call to be such neighbors that pray. And I pray, God, that as we just take moments to commit our heart to be prayer warriors and to be workers of men and women who are praying for those around us, that, Lord, you would lead us and guide us and provide courage for us and strength for us and compel us enough to love people well so that we would pray for them. Lord, all across this room, I pray commitments are being made that when we walk out of here, we walk out of here with commitment maybe to prayer walk, maybe to pray for one, but a commitment to honor and obey you. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen.